So um, I'm going to uh, talk about um, just uh, some guidelines uh, regarding the hypertension management. Um, and basically, this is the most updated um, uh, literature regarding uh, blood pressure. Um, so the outline of my talk, uh, first of all, you know, we'll talk about how to actually do proper measurement in the office for blood pressure. Then we'll talk about classification of uh, hypertension. The, obviously, the guidelines have changed uh, a few years ago regarding some cutoffs for blood pressure uh, management. We'll talk about some treatment, um, um, how to treat it uh, based on guidelines. And then I just wanted to give an introduction regarding device-based therapies because, you know, in the European guidelines last year, they actually introduced the uh, option of doing um, device-based uh, renal intervention for resistant hypertension. And then at the end, I'm just going to have a little talk about hypertensive emergency urgency since this is all in the guidelines. So we'll start with how to do a proper blood pressure measurement. This is actually very, very important. You know, what happens usually when a patient comes to your clinic, um, you know, the nurse comes, you know, the patient comes in, he's a bit maybe uh, distressed, either maybe because he was waiting for a while or he's, he was walking and running for his appointment. And then the nurse just lets him sit in the chair and they measure the blood pressure and they get a reading. And this is actually not the appropriate way to measure blood pressure. The appropriate way is to really prepare the patient properly. So the patient has to be relaxed. He's sitting in a chair uh, with his head or his back on the um, backrest, um, fully supported. And then um, obviously um, certain things have to be uh, uh, checked. Like uh, he needs to have, he needs to be obviously uh, not, not, he should not have uh, had any caffeine, uh, no exercise, haven't smoked for at least 30 minutes before the, the blood pressure was measured. You know, his bladder is empty um, and he shouldn't be talking while he's doing this. He shouldn't be resting. So he shouldn't be having conversation with you while he's doing this. And then obviously clothing has to be removed. So his sleeves need to be um, uh, up, uh, you know, when you put the cuff on, um, you know, a lot of nurses, they keep the sleeve on as if, especially with women, because women, you know, a lot of them, they are covered, they're conservative and they don't want to show their skin. But ideally, they should be removing their sleeves, and they should the cuff the cuff should be on the skin. Um, so obviously, measurements while patient is sitting or lying uh, on the exam table, um, and then um, uh, so use a device that is validated, meaning that it's been calibrated. So your machine that you're using needs to be calibrated or checked every day, make sure making sure it's working properly. Um, uh, and then uh, the position of the, the cuff has to be correct in, in the upper arm at the mid sternum and use the correct size. So all of these things, you know, need to be checked. Um, and then take uh, the first time, uh, the first visit in step three. So you have to record the pressure in both arms. So make sure you, the first time you check blood pressure is in both arms and, and use the higher uh, reading as your um, uh, you know, the, as the reading that you record. And uh, and each measurement should be separated by about one to two minutes. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, in terms of if you're going to use auscultatory method of measuring the blood pressure, then you need to make sure that you've done it correctly. A lot of us, we use uh, the, um, the automated machines or the electronic machines, which is fine. Uh, ideally, you should compare... Uh, I mean, if, if the patient has his own pressure, uh, machine at home, then you can compare it with the one that you have in the office, make sure that it's uh, consistent. And then step four, when you document the reading, um, uh, you know, obviously note the time that you took the blood pressure and re record the systolic and diastolic. Um, and then you can use an average of the of the readings you got to estimate blood pressure. Um so this is like the proper way of measuring, and this is very important that you do it correctly in the office. Obviously, you know, uh, you know, to be practical, when you have so many patients that come to your office, if you have twenty patients, it's almost impossible to do this. But at least you should try to do it in 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 in, in most patients um, to get an accurate reading, because that will change the way you kind of treat them. So that's um, that's regarding measurement, and then.
when it comes to testing, um, there's some basic tests that you, you can do for um, primary hypertension. So you can get these panel of tests, which are uh, quite uh, important, things like the, the blood glucose, the CBC, the lipid profile, the uh, renal function, the electrolytes, the thyroid function, urine analysis is actually very important Make sure to, to check for proteinuria and an ECG. These are like very basic things you can do in the first uh, first visit. And then optional testing includes things like echo, uric acid, and the urine albumin creatinine ratio. Um, so the classification of blood pressure. So what, what is the classification? How do we classify what is considered hypertension and normal tension and things like that? So I just wanted to show you this chart. Uh, I kind of like this chart because if you look at... Um, uh, back in the 1969. So 1969, we had a man in the moon, but we did not have any recommendation for treatment of blood pressure. We did not treat blood pressure at all. We didn't uh, We didn't think someone who had 160 blood pressure should be treated. So that's quite amazing. But since the 1970s up till now, you can see there's a trend that is kind of downward um, in terms of the blood pressure goals or the blood pressure targets. So at some point, in, in the 1970s and 80s, the systolic target was 160. And then um, in, in up to like the mid 2000s, the blood pressure target went down to 140 systolic and, it's, and a diastolic of 90. So, so things have changed over the last few decades. And then came the, the study called SPRINT, which is like a landmark trial in blood pressure. And back in 2015, so it's about seven years, eight, seven, eight years ago, um, this this trial came and it kind of changed the um, classification. So I'll talk about sprint later on, but basically the cutoff used to be 140 and now it's 130 uh, systolic. So um, we'll we'll again we'll talk about sprint in a, in, in a few slides down um, because it was a landmark trial and it changed the guidelines. So if we look at the the guideline recommendation, so this is from ACC AHA. Um, and we'll we'll talk about some other guidelines later, but I wanted to just focus on one strictly one guidelines, which is the American guidelines, um, and the other guidelines that are very similar to this. Um, but I didn't want to like spend too much time on on you know comparing guidelines. Um, essentially, in in uh, in two thousand three, um, obviously the, the the consensus is that anyone with a systolic of less than one twenty and a diastolic of less than eighty has normal blood pressure. Um, anything above um, 120 or 120 to 129 was considered in the old guidelines prehypertension, or even like 130 to 139 was considered prehypertension. But in the newer guidelines, they've changed it. So the cutoff now is 130, and 130 is above and above is considered stage one. Um, anything uh, between 120 and 129 is just considered elevated blood pressure. And then anything above 140 is just one stage two. So above 140, you're considered stage two, and there's nothing beyond stage two. And it all depends, again, why are we classifying it in stages and stuff like that? Because that will um, um, affect the management. Um, so with stage two, you probably need to do a combination of, of at least one or two drugs, um, as, as opposed to just one drug in stage one um, or lifestyle changes. So we'll get to it. Um, what about out of office blood pressure readings? So we talked about the office blood pressure readings, how important they are, how important it is to actually get a, a good office blood pressure reading when the patient comes to you. But there's also this option of doing ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. And ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, in my opinion, is very, very important. I mean, I think it's more important than doing the office one. The office one, a lot of times, um, it's a little bit uh, exaggerated. It's about 10 millimeter difference. Uh, I mean, a lot of patients, you will see that the office reading is around 10 millimeter more than the home reading. And that's why it's important to actually do ambulatory blood pressure monitoring either with a device or let the patient log it at home. So what does the ambulatory blood pressure, how is, how, why is it useful? Because it can differentiate between white coat hypertension and mask hypertension. So or if you have actually confirmed sustained blood pressure, which is what you're suspecting when you're when the patient comes to the office. So with confirmed or sustained blood pressure, elevated office and out of uh, average BP is, is consistent. 
So um, this is when you actually should start therapy. So you just confirm that the office pre reading is actually consistent even at home. White coat hypertension. So with white coat hypertension, obviously when the patient comes to your office, the blood pressure is really high. I mean, I, I've actually seen this. There's a lot of examples I have uh, with patients who come with blood pressure 150, 160 systolic. And when you do the ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, you actually see that it's, it's normal most of the time. They only like when they're nervous or stressed or whatever, or they might, when they come to the office, they, their blood pressure is high. So it's it's present in about 10 to 25% of adults um, who come to the office. Um, and in terms of CVD risk profile, patients with white coat, white coat syndrome usually don't have any risk. Um, the It's only risk when it's sustained. When you have sustained high blood pressure, then it's risky. So these guys usually don't need treatment. So white coat hypertension, you don't need to treat them. When it comes to mask hypertension, obviously, so some patients will come to your office with normal blood pressure, but when you when you do the ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, you'll see that their blood pressure at home is much higher. It's kind of unusual, but again, about 10 to 25% of the population. And obviously these patients you need to treat. So you really need to treat these patients, start them on, on therapy. So this is this is the importance of ambulatory uh, monitoring, and I actually recommend it for most patients that you encounter. And I, I think it's very useful to have it in your um, uh, in your clinic or in your center, wherever you work, to get that um, um, in your office. Okay. Um, so what are the um, so a little bit about secondary hypertension? So um, not every patient that you see, you need to check for secondary hypertension, but there are certain criteria. One of the criteria is if someone is young, he's, he's like younger than 30 years old or, um, or 35 years old, then obviously one of the things you have to check is secondary causes. Or if you have a patient um, who's on multiple medications and you have resistance, then potentially you can also consider um, uh, searching for secondary causes. So the most common causes of secondary hypertension is really renovascular disease. So renovascular is more common. Some people always check for pheochromocytoma, but pheochromocytoma is actually very rare. It's about 1% of secondary, uh, of, of uh, it, I mean, in terms of uh, a cause for secondary hypertension is about 1% to 2% compared to renovascular, which is much higher. So, or primary aldosteronism could be one and uh, OSA, drug or alcohol induced. So these are the most common causes. The rest less common things like Cushing syndrome, pheochromocytoma, coarctation, um, you know, things like that. So we'll talk about some threshold for treatment. So you have the non-pharmacological um, therapy, which is lifestyle changes, and the, um, and the drug therapy. Um, so uh, we'll talk about that soon. And why is it important to treat hypertension is because it is actually, a the, you know, hypertension is actually a global burden. Um, it's actually one of the leading causes of uh, morbidity, mortality in the world. Um, and, and it's very important to treat it. And as you can see in this chart, there's actually a, a linear relationship between um, blood pressure um, elevation and um, ischemic heart disease or mortality. So the, the higher the blood pressure, the more, uh, I mean, the, 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 the more likely you're going to end up having uh, disease um, in the heart. So, um, and uh, um, um, looking at uh, some of the thresholds right now, so um, essentially, if you have um, normal blood pressure, then you just have recommendations just to have a healthy lifestyle. I mean, obviously, you don't go crazy and start eating whatever you want and not exercising. Obviously, you have to be consistent. So even if you have a normal blood pressure, you should have a healthy lifestyle. Now, if you have elevated blood pressure, um, above 120, um, then um, um, it's recommended that you don't, uh, I mean, you, you, there's a non-pharmacological non therapy is recommended, so lifestyle changes. Um, uh, and then when, it, when you have someone between 130, 139 systolic or 80, 89 diastolic, you check their ASCVD risk score. So you can do any risk score you want, but based on the American guidelines, they recommend the 10-year uh, ASCVD risk score. So you can use a calculator. There's a lot of these apps with calculators and you can calculate the ASCVD risk. So if the, if the risk is less than 10% and they have this elevated blood pressure, then you can consider just lifestyle changes or non-pharmacological therapy. 
Um, obviously, if their risk is more than 10%, then you'll have to consider starting on antihypertensive uh, medications. So um, uh, uh, so th those are the category of patients. And obviously, if they're diabetic or they have kidney disease, their age is more than 65 and the blood pressure systolic is more than 130, then obviously those guys also get uh, pharmacological therapy initiated. So what is the BP targets during treatment? I talked about SPRINT trials, so I just wanted to go through it with you because that was a landmark trial. Uh, with SPRINT, uh, what, they, what they wanted to look at is examine the effects of more intensive high blood pressure treatment than what was recommended in the past because what was recommended before was a target of 140. So they wanted to see, uh, they wanted to randomize between intensive treatment and standard th treatment. So the, they had about 9,000 uh, patients or more than 9,000 patients um, and they uh, um, uh, randomized them to the intensive arm and the standard treatment arm and they, they looked at the outcomes. Um, so what method did they use to measure blood pressure? So they did what we um, kind of talked about earlier. Um, so they, they measured the blood pressure while the patient was resting. They used the Omron machine, uh, which is very popular um, all over the world, uh, the Omron um, electronic uh, blood pressure uh, machine. So they, may, they obviously ensure that there's proper patient positioning and cuff size. Um, they measured the, the blood pressure. Um, so this was a, kind of a, a, a controversial issue with or without staff attendance, but then they looked at the sub-analysis and that was um, kind of um, uh, overlooked. And then they they averaged the readings. So uh, what if you look at this chart, so there's the standard treatment arm and intensive treatment arm. And if you look at the bottom here, you'll see that the standard arm had about 1.8 medications. So about two medications in the standard arm and about three medications in the intensive arm. So on average, the intensive pa patients had three, three medications compared to the standard two. And they managed to actually achieve consistent results throughout the time they actually uh, followed these patients. So the average um, uh, blood pressure in the standard arm was about 135 and the intensive arm was about 121.5. And this actually, this trial uh, was quite impressive. So it actually um, uh, uh, was uh, stopped early because they found that there was um, very um, um, uh, positive outcomes in the intensive arm. Um, so looking at the outcomes uh, and about uh, the primary outcome, which is CVD, mortality, MI, non-MI, uh, ACS stroke, there was about 25% reduction in um uh, uh, in uh, you know the the uh, the primary outcome. So then the intensive arm did did much better than the standard arm, and then death from any cause there was also um, substantial. So it was about twenty seven percent reduction. So that this this trial was so positive that they stopped it early. And then if you look at the uh, uh, the the uh, this chart, so even the subgroup analysis whether you had, um, you know, based on age, sex, race, or previous uh, kidney disease, basically the, the, um, the, uh, the, the, the treatment favors the intensive arm than the standard uh, arm uh, in general, even the subgroup analysis. And then looking at the meta-analysis, so this is what the um, uh, guideline committees looked at. Um, there was also meta-analysis based on multiple other trials, um, and those other randomized trials also showed consistent findings uh, with SPRINT. So essentially, um, with intensive treatment, you had better outcomes. Um, so similar findings to uh, SPRINT. Um, so looking at the uh, evidence review committee, they looked at these meta-analysis of these 19 randomized control trials with these uh, several year follow-ups and they found that the relative risk um, reduction in major CVD MI stroke heart failure was, was significant. So based on this, um, the totality of findings in the writing uh, committee were unanimous in their opinion. So that the target of less than 130 during antihypertensive therapy is desirable for prevention of, of MI stroke heart failure and major CVD events. So looking again at the targets, um, so um, as mentioned, um, 
anyone um, who has a blood pressure uh, of more, more than 130, those patients should be um, really treated, uh, whether it's pharmacological or non-pharmacological. So again, the target is now uh, more than 130 systolic or more than um, 80 diastolic. And why did they choose 130? So you say, you know, Sprint, they actually did uh, intensify the treatment to actually 120, not 130. Um, so why did they choose 130 as opposed to 120? Um, th this is the reason behind it. They they mentioned it in the guidelines. And uh, essentially, um, this is the explanation, but you don't have to really understand it. But they looked at trials and things like this, and they looked at adverse events um, uh, based on intensive treatment. And the uh, 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 you know there was some certain adverse events that occurred, but we'll talk about them. But essentially, they came up with a consensus that it should be less than one thirty uh, uh, is a cutoff value. Uh, so, looking at other guidelines, so if we look at the uh, Canadian guidelines from twenty sixteen, they also recommended the same thing. They said intensive blood pressure treatment to a target of one thirty and high risk patient. Um, so. They they also mentioned things like shared decision making regarding safe implementation of intensive treatment uh, um, control, and the Australian guidelines also in 2016 they also um, recommended um, uh, a lower blood pressure target. The same thing with the American Diabetes Association. So just just a little comparison compared uh, to to compare the ACC with other guideline recommendations. Um, so I just wanted to talk about some of the adverse events. That, that may occur with intensive therapy. So with intensive therapy, there were some uh, associated adverse events, one of them being electrolyte, uh, electrolyte abnormalities and small decrease in GFR, but that's possible. There's some risk of hospitalization, um, you know, because the blood pressure is much lower, they may, you know, they may faint or they may have some presyncopal events or something like that, and they end up going to the hospital. Uh, this may happen with intensive treatment compared to non-intensive treatment. But when you look at the balance of benefit and adverse effects, uh, should not should not be equally weighted. So you can't just try to weigh things equally uh, based on benefit, uh, adverse and adverse effects. Uh, because with with uh, 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 the benefits really outweigh here the adverse effects. So even if you have a little bit of adverse effects, it should not make you say, okay, I should... Um, uh, uh, lower the therapy, or I should like, um, and, um, you know, lower the intensity of the therapy, um, and choose a target of 140 or 150, whatever you know comes to your mind. That shouldn't shouldn't be the case. The case should be that um, I should continue intensive therapy, but within reason, obviously. But your target should still be around 120 systolic or one at least below 130. So. Um, because they, they found that there was a substantial uh, benefit when it comes to lowering uh, blood pressure. Um, and then, um, so clinicians can manage or mitigate adverse effect by modifying the intensity of the treatment or discontinuing treatment. So if you found that obviously being too intense is too, too adverse, then obviously um, it's a judgment call and based on your experience and clinical um, judgment, then you can um, tailor the, the therapy for the patient. So, do not underestimate the um, the um, the proven benefit of non pharmacological treatments. So these are some of the non pharmacological treatments that you can recommend for your patients, and um, uh, and it's very important to actually uh, emphasize this because I think just taking medications and not uh, uh, emphasizing some of these things um, can make a huge difference. So weight loss, weight loss is very important. So for each kilogram of weight you lose, you can lose about one millimeter of uh, one millimeter mercury of blood pressure. So if you lose like 10 kilograms, you'll end up losing 10 millimeter mercury. So it, weight loss is very important. DASH diet, so healthy diet, what is recommended is the DASH diet, which is basically a diet rich in fru fruits and vegetables um, and low fat. So with the DASH diet, you can actually lower the blood pressure by about uh, 11 millimeter mercury. So if you have hypertension, you can lower it by as much as 11. So it's a very effective uh, form of um, reducing blood pressure. Dietary sodium or salt, so reducing the salt intake. 
can also um, um, play a big role. So if you limit the salt intake and you, you emphasize this, you can lower it by about uh, five or six millimeters. So, uh, potassium, so a lot of people don't know about this, but potassium rich foods, so potassium itself, uh, by increasing your potassium in, uh, in, um, uh, uh, intake, you can lower your blood pressure. So if you have a potassium of between four and 4.5 uh, milli equivalents, then uh, that's actually very good. So eating potassium rich foods like bananas or uh, some, some green vegetables, um, dates and things like this can actually be uh, very beneficial when lowering blood pressure. It can actually lower it by about five uh, millimeter mercury. Exercise, exercise is very important, um, whether it's a, a aerobic or resistant exercise, um, those are very effective in lowering blood pressure. So if you emphasize the fact that they can do a little bit of exercise on a daily basis, about one or two hours a day, um, it can be very helpful. And obviously alcohol, so um, um, lowering alcohol intake, actually now it's recommended that you don't drink alcohol. Um, so by, by lowering your consumption, then you can also reduce your blood pressure. So those are some of the non-pharmacological or lifestyle modifications that you can emphasize to your patients. When it comes to drugs, so there's first-line drug therapy or first-line agents. Um, obviously, again, you have to tailor it based on other core mor morbidities. But in general, um, the the, the first-class therapies um, and the guidelines are really ACE inhibitor, ARB, uh, calcium channel blockers, and uh, to some extent diuretics and beta blockers. So when it comes to between ACE and ARBs, uh, I didn't put it in the slide, but ideally, um, you know, the recommendation now is to go with an ARB. So if you can start with an ARB better than starting with an ACE. Um, um, and essentially, there's no difference between the two. The only the difference is that with the ACE, you can have uh, side effects, more side effects compared to ARB. So they can have cough, they can have edema, uh, angioedema, things like this with ACE inhibitors. So um, if you can avoid them and just put them on an ARB, better. So so that's my recommendation is to go with an ARB. Um, and then to some extent, combination therapy is also very useful. So you can use an ARB with a diuretic or an ARB with a calcium channel blocker, uh, things like that. So, um, uh, so initiate treatment with two drugs in most patients. So in patients with stage two hypertension, uh, obviously, you need to, to put them on two drugs. Um, so anything above 140 systolic, then you have to really consider a combination therapy. So basically, each drug will... So one drug will probably lower the blood pressure by about 10 millimeter mercury, give my, give or take uh, one, one or two there. So if you have a blood pressure of 140 and your target is 120, then you need to put them on two drugs. Uh, so combination pill is, is better. You know, we have a lot of options in Kuwait in terms of combination pills. So you have things like uh, Twinista, Xforge, uh, um, Concor AM. There's a, there's a whole host of them um, that you can choose from. Um, this is because of this is American guys. So we talk about blacks. I don't think we have a lot of African Americans or black population, but the 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 choice for those those kind of people is not ACE or ARB. It's actually a diuretic or a calcium channel blocker. Uh, so obviously it mentions here do not use an ACE and ARB uh, together. That's very very harmful. So never put an ACE and an ARB uh, together uh, when you're combining drugs. Um, so uh, so when you initiate the therapy, obviously you need to follow them very closely. Um, so make sure they're adherent to the medication and, and responsive to the treatment um, at least, at least uh, monthly intervals until control is achieved. So you have to really follow them closely until you've um, achieved the goal and you're comfortable and you know that um, the therapy is, is, is effective. Um, so what about older adults? So patients who are above 65 years old, uh, who have an average blood pressure of one, uh, more than 130 systolic. Um, so if, if it's a good elderly person, like he's uh, to walk, he's ambulatory, uh, fragile or debilitated or anything like this, like a normal adult above 65, you can treat them as if it's anyone else. Um, with a blood pressure target of less than 130. 
obviously if you have a very elderly person above 65 and they're debilitated they're ectic or they have you know they, they just don't look good they're not ambulatory they're bed bound what whatever um then you'd have to kind of have a more um tailored approach or more team based approach regarding risk benefit um in terms of uh, blood pressure goals so you may be more gentle with these patients and be more conservative uh, so when it comes to diabetics, you're going to have a talk about this, but just to talk about it really quick, adults with blood pressure and high blood pressure and diabetes, um, again, um, uh, initiate therapy if the blood pressure is more than 130. Um, and then you have a bunch of um, first line. Again, the first line I would recommend is an ARB uh, compared to others, and then you can consider uh, um, adding a calcium channel blocker or diuretics. Uh, especially if you have proteinuria. So if you have proteinuria, then you'd have to do uh, ACE or ARBs because th these are renally protective. Um, so what about heart failure patients? Again, you're going to have a talk about this. But with heart failure patients, um, there's what's called guideline-directed medical therapy, GDMT. And with guideline-directed medical therapy, now with the heart failure, um, um, the first thing is you have to know there's four pillars. Um, it's not written here but there's really four pillars. Um, so the first pillar is put them, putting them on a guideline uh, recommended beta blocker. So the guideline recommended beta blockers are bisoprolol, um, carvedilol, and the long acting uh, metoprolol. Those are the only three guideline directed beta, beta blockers for heart failure. So the first thing you do is the guideline directed beta blocker. The second thing recommended is actually entresto. Um, over ACE and ARB. So if you have the luxury of putting them on Entresto, then put it put Entresto over an ACE and ARB. This is the recommended thing. The third thing is an SGL2 inhibitor. And then the fourth thing is, um, you know, potentially aldactone. Uh, so these are, those are the four pillars. Um, obviously, if, if the blood pressure is not not controlled with these, then you can add things like calcium channel, but not, not the, the ones that are... Um, that have a negative inotropic effect. So you can't put them on isoptin, for example, for Um, So just make sure that's the case. When it comes to HEF, PEF, um, if they have symptoms of volume overload, to so consider prescribing a diuretic. Um, obviously with HEF, PEF, there hasn't been any um, um, uh, medications that are effective in HEF, PEF, uh, other than SGL2 inhibitor, but this SGL2 does not treat blood pressure and we're talking blood pressure here. So, but essentially you have to control the blood pressure because that will improve um, uh, their um, heart uh, heart condition in general. So again, consider an ARB or an ACE or beta blocker and, and, and the blood pressure goal is less than 130. So what about patients with uh, heart disease? So with heart disease, again, um, depending on the heart, the, the heart condition, um, I mean, usually when we're talking about um, ischemic heart disease, and all people, they just knee jerk and put them on beta blockers um, um, as a, a like a reflex. But you don't have to put every single patient um, who has ischemic heart disease on a beta blocker. Um, if if they've had significant MI or they had a uh, uh, you know they have significant uh, coronary disease, then okay, you can put them on a beta blocker and then consider adding th things like an ACE or an ARB. But don't always just consider beta blockers as a first line in these patients. Uh, other drugs include things like um, CCBs and mineral corticoids. Um, if you have angina, uh, if you have hypertension and angina, and we see this patients who have high blood pressure, they start complaining of uh, chest pains. And if you control the blood pressure, the chest pain actually improves considerably. So you can consider, again, um, uh, things like beta blockers and calcium channel blockers because they have some anti-anginal um, effect, not just in lowering blood pressure, but they also have anti-anginal um, benefits. Um, so in adults uh, who have had an MI or ACS, reasonable to continue goal-directed medical therapy with beta blockers um, uh, uh, you know, beyond three years. Uh, and again, patients who have coronary disease uh, without HEFREF and who had angina, uh, 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 then uh, uh, who had an MI more than three years previously, consider beta blockers or calcium channel blockers. And again, the target is less than 130. Uh, so what about CKD patients? Again, you're going to have a talk about this, uh, but treatment, um, 
uh, with ACE inhibitors um, um, uh, can slow down progression or ARBs. So even if you have a GFR that is low, but more than 20, like stage three uh, CKD, then you can consider uh, continuing ACE or ARBs. Um, uh, and it's reasonable in these kind of patients. I'm just going to go quickly because I know my time is about to be complete. Um, so strategies to improve uh, hypertension and control. So adherence strategies, so things like combination pills, once daily dosing as, as opposed to polypharmacy. Again, polypharmacy is a big issue. Uh, strategies to promote lifestyle changes, uh, team-based care with health professionals and pharmacists, um, uh, telehealth strategies. Um, we don't have it in Kuwait, but I think it's very useful. Um, you know, financial incentives, performance measures, and quality improvement initiatives. Um, so this is a little bit about um, resistant hypertension. So patients generally who have been prescribed more than three medications, um, including a diuretic, and their blood pressure reading is still elevated despite being on all these three medications, then they have resistant hypertension. Obviously, you have to ensure it's not pseudo-resistance. Um, it's actually uh, uh, true. So they're adherent to their medications. You know, get ambulatory blood pressure monitoring again, ensure that it is truly resistant. Um, and then if they do have resistant hypertension, there are certain things you can do, maximize the therapy and add an aldactone. Uh, you know, it's quite useful in these situations. And um, uh, and then refer to a specialist. Um, so we'll talk about, you know, since we're talking about resistant hypertension, one of the things that came up recently is renal denervation. So I don't know a lot of people are familiar with this. But my recommendation, if you do have someone with resistant hypertension and he's on more than three drugs, then you can refer them for uh, device-based therapy, which is renal denervation. I'll talk about it really quickly. Uh, basically, um, you know, uh, it's known that a lot of patients are non adherent to medication. Approximately two of every five patients uh, who have uncontrolled blood pressure are basically non adherent. It's not easy to be adherent to medications in general. Uh, so basically what the target is in these therapies is the sympathetic renal nerves. So sympathetic uh, renal nerves play a role in terms of blood pressure. So it can increase sodium retention um, and cause proteinuria and cause resistance. So this is one of the targets they looked at when it comes to um, blood pressure control. And essentially what it is, is basically we do a, a, a cath, a, a catheterization. And we, we basically... Uh, use a catheter that engages the renal arteries. And uh, we use uh, a special catheter that denervates or ablates the nerves in the in the renals. So um, uh, 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 basically, it's a very safe procedure. It's been shown to be very effective and very safe. Um, so the, the, the safety profile is very good. Some patients, you know, when you tell them about ablating nerves in the renals, they get uh, freaked out and they think it's uh, crazy and you know, there's some risk, but actually the risk is very, very, very low. It's a very safe procedure in general. And there's different ways to do it. Either you do it with ultrasound or you do it with uh, ablation, uh, uh, RFA or alcohol. The most common is the the the, the spiral uh, RFA version that we're using now. So um, this is just about sy uh, sympathetic drive. Um in terms of blood pressure, so if you have one of the one of the theories behind blood pressure uh, elevation is sympathetic drive, so that's what the um, the uh, denervation targets. Um, so I don't want to go through that. And what what is the evidence? The evidence is there's been a a, a lot of over the last five years. There's been a lot of trials um, on uh, renal denervation therapy, and this is one of them. Simplicity. So they looked at 500 patients, over 500 patients in 88 sites in the US. It was a double-blinded study. Um, patients enrolled were between 18, 18 and 80 years old with resistant hypertension. So systolic blood pressure more than 160 or more than three meds. They randomized two to one. So they had some in the sham, which is basically they did not do renal denervation. They just did some sh sham control thing. And then the other uh, under underwent uh, the therapy. And they followed them for six months. The primary endpoint was office blood pressure uh, cha uh, uh, change of more than five millimeters. Um, and then the secondary endpoint was change in 24-hour ambulatory pressure of more than six months, uh, at, at six months, sorry. So they looked at that and they found that there was actually significant um, um, 
a drop in blood pressure in the renal denervation arm compared to the sham arm. So um, uh, 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 again, I don't want to go through this. Um, basically, there's been these are all the trials that have been go ongoing since 2009. So actually in 2009, uh, there was this first time they actually did this therapy, but wasn't very effective, probably because the, the, the catheter they used um, was not as advanced as it is now. So now the, the, the catheter is way more advanced. It can ablate, ablate more nerves in the renals. And that's why it probably picked up after about more than a decade. Um, so since then, we've had a lot of trials um, showing the efficacy of this therapy. Um, again, this is just that. Um, I'll go through this really quickly. So hypertensive emergency urgency. So if you have someone who comes into the ER, maybe this is not applicable to, um, or it, it actually it is applicable to GPs. If you have someone who comes to you with a high blood pressure, uh, more than 180, uh, systolic, more than 120, diastolic, you know, some of the, um, if it's, it's, it's classified as emergency, if there's any, acute life-threatening life manifestations, target and organ damage, whether it's hypertensive encephalopathy, hemorrhage, ischemia, um, uh, MI, renal failure. So this is considered emergency. This is when you have to admit to the ICU for you know continuous monitoring. So hemodynamic invasive monitoring needs to be done and IV uh, antihypertensives need to be initiated. So these patients have to go to the ICU. Um, so those who have urgency, on the other hand, um, so these patients, they're considered urgent, not emergent. Um, there's no, uh, uh, if there's no uh, target end organ damage or things like that, then um, you can reduce the systolic pressure about 25%. You don't really need to send them to ICU. You can manage them in the ward, uh, but this is basically the difference between the two. So in summary, um, again, sorry I took so long. Accurate blood pressure uh, measurements is, uh, to improve diagnosis and management of hypertension is essential. So you need to make sure your office readings is, is accurate. And on top of that, I recommend ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. More intensive BP control uh, than previously recommended. So the guidelines now recommend target of less than 130 systolic and less than 80 diastolic. Um, employee strategies to improve blood pressure control. And then emergence of renal denervation is an option in select patients, patients who have resistant hypertension or not adhered to therapy. Thank you very much.